Hmm. So it's sort of been. Okay, it's been it just a, popped up on my screen that we're streaming live on Facebook. Awesome. It does look like, yep, we're live. So I'm going to hit record. Great. All right. And I'm going to make you host. Well, I, it always says I can share my screen. Um, well, uh, I, we'll just be safe and sorry. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Coffee Talk. I'm your host, Ashley, and as you are all aware, our host, or excuse me, our guest today, what am I saying, <laughs> is the great lawyer, Peter Wright. He's taken time out of his day today to share with us some information, and we are so excited to have him. Thank you so much, Pete, for joining us today. Well, Ashley, thank you for having me. It's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure, and uh, I have enjoyed going through some of the fire sessions uh, episodes that you have and uh, really very impressed, really, really good quality, good content. And um, it's a, a, a great place for someone to really get into the whole field of understanding dyslexia and, and being a parent and how to get services for your child and, and what to do. Uh, as, as I shared with you before we, uh, when we had first had contact about doing this, I have to have for myself some kind of a clear outline where I'm going, how I'm going to get there. Otherwise, I'll go all over the place. And um, you know, while we can have a discussion back and forth, you and I, um, uh, if I, if we just do that, you know, there may not be any real organization or, or symmetry or uh, we'll have fears and anxieties that, that um, I got everybody confused and lost them. So I've actually, uh, I create a, uh, I created an outline, a PowerPoint outline of sorts, and. And so we'll go ahead and shift over, share screen, and let's see how this works. Okay. So I'm going to try to share my screen now and open up um, that. And you should see a slide that says the Dyslexia Initiative, the Dyslexia Coffee Talk. And do you see that slide is the first thing on your, uh, on your I screen? I do. Oh, I right. do. Okay. That's working. Now I'm going to bear with you for a minute. I'm going to cut back on the visual distractions on my screen that's my face and your face so i just, I just close that window so i don't see that and i'll go to the to the uh next slide so basically i'm calling the special ed law applied uh, we have one hour and i'm not going to do a full uh, um, educational jam session here but um i i do have um uh, a bunch of stuff in this slideshow and these slides are, this slideshow is already up on our website. I put it up this morning and I don't want you to, I don't, I don't want anyone to go there right now because uh, you're going to get distracted trying to go back and forth and you're going to get several slides ahead of where I am and, um, and then get lost when you try to come back. But just go to rightclaw.com uh, forward slash dyslexia and I have th these slides up here, up there, not as full screen, but as four slides to the eight and a half by 11 uh, page. And um, at the uh, same time, I do have a, another thing up there about our, our dyslexic children, but I'll mention that later on. So moving on, the agenda, a little background about Beat Right, and then what the three key statutes that impact kids with dyslexia, IDEA 504, Americans with Disabilities Act, and then I'll be wrapping up with some, some cases uh, that, uh, depending upon how much time we have and how fast or how slow I talk, uh, that uh, are instructive with regard to uh, understanding the application of the law to the facts and, and then a little summary. So that's kind of the agenda. So who, who's Pete Wright? Well, DC public schools, they told my parents I was uneducable, that I was mentally retarded, and that I was emotionally disturbed. And I had a, comp my parents got a comprehensive private sector evaluation. And the evaluators found that I had stephosembolia and an acute hyperkinetic disorder. So stephosembolia was a term that was coined by uh, Dr. Samuel T. Wharton, July 25, 1925, he, he did a whole program about word blindness in, in school children, and word blindness was dyslexia. Uh, it was trephosembolia at that time, dyslexia, now dyslexia, dyscraphia, dyscalculia. And uh, four years later, 1929, he did a whole paper uh, all about sight reading, now known as whole language, and how it damaged children with dyslexia. If you try to use that approach for a kid with dyslexia, you're going to damage a child. And that has been out there since 1929. Okay, a little background. Uh, 
the evaluators uh, evaluated me and told my parents that I was basically totally illiterate, couldn't read, write, spell, or do arithmetic, but that I had a good brain, that I was uh, intellectually bright, but that I was illiterate, and they had to find someone who was skilled in using this approach to teach children with cephalosomolia how to read, write, spell, and do arithmetic. They had to find someone who was skilled in the Orton-Gillingham approach. Dr. Orton joined forces with Anna Gillingham in the 1930s, and they created this approach, and my parents found a lady by the name of Diana Henbury King, and she worked with me every day after school for almost two years of one-on-one -on -one use in Orton Gillingham. And I went, attended a residential camp, an Orton Gillingham camp. Uh, between the two years, her goal was not to get me to age and grade level. Her goal was to get me two years above age and grade. And when I was in the sixth grade, I was given another comprehensive psychoeducational uh, evaluation. And it was found that in all domains, I was on the eighth grade level. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and spelling, and every one of them, I was above uh, age and grade. She accomplished her objective. And the significance uh, of, of all this is that I am um, an example of early intervention, very early, from being provided to me by someone who ended up becoming one of the, the best in the, in the world. Uh, the National Teachers Hall of Fame gave her a Lifetime Achievement Award a couple of years ago and called her the Einstein of Education. So yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not your typical adult dyslexic who, who struggles today with either reading, writing, or spelling. I, they, they, are, they, are, they are a breeze, they are a snap. And so I, I don't struggle. My biggest issue though, the acute hyperkinetic disorder, today's labels, ADD, ADHD. And that, you know, that's always there, as you will have recognized by the end of the, <laughs> the, end of the hour. Uh, so uh, I went off to college, I got involved in juvenile justice, began working in juvenile training schools, later juvenile courts, was a probation officer. And while I was a juvenile probation officer, I actually joined the Orton Dyslexia Society. I had a kid with dyslexia and um, was talking with his tutor one day and told her that, um, yeah, I had these problems too when I was younger. And she said, yeah, yeah, right. You know, well, lots of people have these problems. And I said, yeah, I could tell she didn't believe me. I mean, she blew it off. And I, I tried to tell her a couple of times that I did understand because I didn't know the kid that I was working with had dyslexia. And I, so then I blurted out, I said, well, you know, my tutor was Diana Hanbury King and her face dropped. Oh, oh my gosh, you really do. <laughs> She's the best. She's the best out there. Oh my God. And so you, she said, you've got to join the, the, um, the Dyslexia Society and the Learning School Association uh, of America, joined all them, and I did. Uh, actually, uh, before I went to law school, uh, I presented at a national conference all about juvenile delinquency and reading problems. And, and here's the link uh, to that. And then um, after uh, law school, about 10 years after that, I had the Carter case. Now, this, uh, these slides are up on the website, so you don't worry about the copying these links down. I had a case before the U.S. Supreme Court, Carter case, Shannon Carter. Um, and also, when I do my live, uh, I, up until COVID, I was doing live programs, six hours uh, uh, um, a, a, for, for a day-long program. And I opened with my school records. I actually put my D.C. report card uh, up on, um, on screen. So if anyone wants to see them, they are up on YouTube in the Rights Law channel. And there's Diana Henbury King. So uh, <clears throat> Uh, I later did an article for the Orton Dyslexia uh, newsletter, and it's called Three Generations of Dyslexia at the U.S. Supreme Court, because I had dyslexia, my client, Shannon Carter, had dyslexia, and one of my tutors from camp, Roger Saunders, who later became president of the Orton Dyslexia Society, he was also there in the audience at the Supreme Court, so that's a whole article about that, and then the story behind the story, the untold story behind the Shannon Carter case. Her IEP said she would go from the 5.4 to the 5.8 reading grade equivalent level as measured by the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test. She was in the ninth grade with above average IQ. So that meant that her scores in reading were going to get go fall downhill. She was going to get steadily worse. So that's a little, you know, just a little background who's Pete Wright. We uh, ended up having a unanimous uh, decision in 34 days from the U.S. Supreme Court. I thought that would be my background. Now we're going to get into the three statutes. We're not going to do any in-depth uh, uh, analysis. I mean, when I do my 
a six hour program. Even that's not enough time to do in depth on, on all the law, but uh, we're going to uh, give it a try here to skim through it quickly. So we're grateful for anything you can share. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the early history is um, uh, kids who had disabilities were not allowed to attend school. They were, the school systems routinely, regularly expelled or suspended children with disabilities and, and um, said they couldn't afford to do this, they couldn't afford to do that. If your child uh, was in a wheelchair and they didn't have ramps, sorry, child can't attend school. And, and it was even a statute in Pennsylvania that said if a child was deemed to be uneducable to find by a school psychologist, the school had no responsibility to have to uh, educate the child. And all this had to do with basically the dollars and the costs. So there were uh, several uh, big cases that went on, the Park case and the Mills case. that got a lot of publicity in the Washington Post, caused Congress to hold a bunch of hearings about uh, should there be a federal law requiring that children with disabilities be educated. And they, they said yes, they passed the law in 1975. It was known as the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. And the early cases in the earlier years and I went, uh, I, I went to law school, uh, well, I got out of law school in um, December 77. I, I went to law school starting in 75, got out uh, a semester early, I uh, overloaded on courses and began practicing law in uh, 78, spring of 78. The, the law had, just, had come out in 75, but the final regs didn't come out until August 77. So I was uh, in on the ground floor and got involved right away in doing special ed cases. And many people don't realize that the, uh, the law did not go into effect all around the country, just by, with certain states that decided to accept federal funds. And when there were cases, uh, many of them had to do with whether a child was or was not eligible for an IEP. And then uh, how did you define the word appropriate? In Virginia, a kid had autism, it was upheld by a federal court. The kid was not eligible for special ed because it was deemed to be a medical condition. And the, the, the case law has changed and the statutes have changed and of course now that's no longer an issue, but it was. One thing that's important to remember is that the federal law is supreme pursuant to the supremacy clause of the constitution. So whenever you're wrestling with the question, what does the law say about this and say about that? I've heard some, so many people say, well, you know, in our state, we don't follow the federal law. We just use the state regulation. And, and that's all we do. We don't really pay attention to the federal law. Well, you know, um, actually, the, you, know, you do pay attention to the federal law. The state regulations may not take away a right provided by federal law. Most state regulations are a carbon, carbon copy of the federal regulations and often the federal statute. But the federal regulations were issued by the U.S. Department of Education. They don't have the power to take away a right provided by Congress, by the federal law, by the federal statute. Federal regs um, are second to, to the statute, state statutes and state regulations of Spain. They are secondary. They do not have the power to take away a right provided by Congress. So when you're analyzing, trying to find the answer to a legal, legal question, always start with a federal statute first. Start there as your starting point, then look at the federal regulation, then look at your state statutes, your state regs, and then that's just part of it. Then you've got to find out has there been any legal decisions in any cases uh, on that issue that uh, provide more specificity. So um, with regard to getting for you, for the people that are watching this now, for you to get a good handle on some of the issues that pop up with 504 and, and IDEA accommodations, modifications, goals, I do highly recommend that you go to season one, episode three of the Dyslexia Coffee Talk, where you'll hear Ashley Roberts and Enid Webb talk uh, in, in, in web talk about this. Uh, they, they know their stuff, they know what they're talking about, and it was a, uh, it's just a superb coffee talk. So quick Thank overview, you. yeah, quick overview. The, the special ed law is not complicated. It is not rocket science. It is easy to understand. So many people think, oh, the law, that, that's scary, you know, that, uh, and uh, I don't want to do that. And yet it really, it's not hard. There are only five key statutes for our purposes primarily just five key statutes. First one is the finding of the Congress and the purpose of the law. Second has all the definitions, the definition of related services, definition of the child with disability. 1412 has all the state responsibility.
capabilities and information about ESY extended school year, LRE, least restrictive environment, and FAPE free appropriate public education. 1414 is a statute that most uh, parents, most of you will be looking at with the greatest frequency because it has all the law of initial evaluations, reevaluations, what it takes to, to determine whether a child is or is not eligible. And the other purpose of all of the evaluations are to determine the child's educational needs. Why do you wanna know educational needs? Because that leads into the IEP. So 1414 has all the law of evaluations and IEP. So that's the one you, you kind of want to zoom in and on um, in more depth. And then 1415 has all of the rules of procedure. If you go to due process hearings, if you don't agree with the evaluation or with the IEP, and also uh, issues of discipline and independent educational evaluation is, is in 1415. So those are the five key statutes, and that's it. So I'm, I'm going to just look at a couple of them very briefly. The most important statute in the entire book is this one here, 1400 subsection P. And it explains that kids are, are to have eight free appropriate public education. And the purpose of it is that it is designed to meet their unique needs and prepare the child for further education, employment, and independent living. And it's the mission statement. That's what you want to be looking at all the time when you're wrestling with, with an issue of this sort. Then uh, in 1401, as I mentioned, has all the definitions. Definitions are all in alphabetical order. So number 30 is specific learning disability. And right there in the definition, it has the word dyslexia. And that has been in the statute since 1975. 1975, it's been in the statute. There is a... Uh, Case I had a case many many years ago against Upper Arlington uh, School District, and the, the um, uh, we prevailed at the Sixth Circuit. And the letter the parents wrote requesting due process hearings on our website, we call it a letter to the stranger. It was a letter requesting due process hearing, and that was the letter that actually caused us to win the case. The um, parents in Upper Arlington, about ten years later. Uh, some parents found that letter because Upper Arlington had gone back downhill again after our case and used that. The Upper Arlington School District is the birthplace of reading recovery in our country. And my client, Joseph James, was one of the first cases to ever have upper, uh, to have reading recovery. And our theme, uh, one of our, our themes of the case was that reading recovery damaged the child. And, uh, the uh, Upper Arlington School District has done an about based in large part uh, due to the efforts of a group who later did a video, a film about it, it's called Dyslexic Children, and um, it is now one of the tops in the country, and all of these special ed teachers are trained in Orton Yellingham. So in that subdirectory on our website, rightslaw.com forward slash dyslexia, I have these uh, slides, and also I have a little flyer from, from this group. Okay, and it's what the um, beginning part of the film looks like. Moving on, the IEP statute has a law with the definitions, what's the definition of an IEP, what are the requirements in an IEP, how do you develop an IEP, uh, re reviewing and revising the IEP. There's no multi-year IEPs, three-year IEPs were allowed by statute so long as a state submitted a plan uh, and laid out all this different kinds of things to do, and it did never happen. So we do not have any three I, three year IEPs in the country. Then what hap what happens if an agency drops the ball on transition objectives, and then kids in prison if a kid had an IEP and went off to prison, it's still entitled to faith unless it would clearly present some kind of a security peniological uh, uh, issue, but otherwise still entitled to faith. And in Texas. Um, they, they, they don't use the word IEP, they use, they use the initials ARD, admission review and the dismissal. And you'll find that around the country, some entities will use different uh, words or labels to describe whatever is in the statute and don't get concerned about that. The next statute, 1415, that has the law of a prior written notice, going to due process hearings, going to court, the state put statute, the discipline statute with regard to uh, IEE it has, has a law in there where parents are able to get an IEE if a school refuses to do to, to provide one at the parent's request. The school 
has to take the parents to a special ed due process hearing in order to ask the hearing officer to prove that the school's last evaluation was appropriate. So that is uh, uh, the, one of the risks that you take in asking for an IEE. A due process hearing is a mixture of a medical malpractice, wrongful death case that has merged with an equitable distribution a divorce and custody case. And it's being litigated pursuant to the federal rules of civil procedure. Now, why do I say that? Because it's a battle of expert witnesses. Uh, both sides feel beating each other. Uh, battle of expert witnesses arguing over shades of gray, and yet both sides also feel betrayed by the other. That's the domestic relations. So it may well have a lot of emotion that is really not healthy to a, to a good uh, outcome for, for either side. And I told my parents that if we win, the school is going to appeal to the U.S. District Court. And if we win to the U.S. District Court, they're going to appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals. For, for where I am in Virginia, that would be the Fourth Circuit. And I told my parents, uh, if we lose that due process, and I think we should take the case on, and I would expect you to give me permission to take the case up. We lose it in federal court. And I think we should go up to the Court of Appeals. I will expect you to give me permission to do that. And the Joseph James case that I just talked about of Arlington, we lost, we had no evidence was heard at due process. We stipulated to what some of the facts were. And based upon that stipulation and a, and a Sixth Circuit case that was out there, the hearing officer dismissed the case on a motion for summary judgment. The reviewing officer upheld the dismissal. We went to the U.S. District Court. District Court dismissed the case. No evidence heard. We went to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. The parents' letter requesting due process, I had it as a notarized exhibit, much like what's called a verified pleading. The Sixth Circuit asked me detailed questions about Upper Arlington and the letter, and they reversed and ruled in our favor. So uh, that's that's why I say it's, I tell parents assume you're going to end up in federal court, so prepare for it now. And at the same time, I tell tell parents you're going to be thinking about sales and marketing and persuasion. And it's not what you believe to be legally right. Because when you get caught up in that mindset, you're going to start arguing law. To, to someone on the other side of the table who doesn't want to hear law and walls will go up right away and you end up closing the doors to, to getting services. Instead, you, you think negotiation tactics and strategy, books like Getting to Yes, uh, that's what opens the doors. And that's a part of my, my much more comprehensive training. Don't let it become a black, white, polarized scenario. There are alternatives to due, due process hearings. You can file complaints with the Office of Civil Rights. You can file complaints with the U.S. Department of Justice. You can file state administrative complaints. So it's not just having to go to due process there. There are alternatives in that Upper Arlington case. They filed a state administrative complaint, a bunch of parents, and they prevailed. And the state came down to Upper Arlington. So uh, it can be successful. It really depends in large part upon the dynamics within your State Department of Education. Can I ask you a question about that? Yes, 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 ma'am. Because um, I see this kind of come up with different answers within the community because, you know, I'm in various groups across the community. And I think some people believe that you can't file a complaint without going to due process. Oh, that's absolutely incorrect. Uh, okay. it, it has, the, the problem has to do with the word complaint. The word complaint in, in the courtroom, in the courthouse, in the, in the legal scenario actually means the lawsuit. You file a complaint to the U.S. District Court, uh, okay. or or whatever else. So, and then the other side files a response of pleading, known as either an answer or a motion for summary judgment or motion to dismiss or whatever else. But complaint is the document, the name of the document, and um, so that's where part of the, I think the confusion comes from. You can file a complaint with your State Department of Education, and it's spelled out right there in IDEA. There's a whole part section in there about filing complaints with the State Department of Education, and, and do not have to file a due process. And what's happened in some states is parent files a complaint, parent prevails, they win. So school system then files a request for due process on the same issue. Mm. And then what happens? Uh, and it, there are some real battles that are going on uh, around the country. And this is kind of evolving uh, as we speak now. And um, we may see something whenever the statute is amended, we may see some 
uh, uh, language. Uh, the, there can be a risk when you file a complaint uh, if it's almost a foregone conclusion that the state is going to rule against the parent and you get an adverse ruling, um, then you may end up making things harder down the road um, mm -hmm. for yourself. So you're, it's a tactical decision and, and, it had, and it comes from knowing the players, knowing which gotcha. best way to go under the facts. So the discipline statute, the real key behind that was, was a misconduct, a manifestation of the kid's disability or not. And if it was, and, and it goes this way, if it was not, it goes that way. And another big issue is with regard to behavioral problems, was there an FBA functional behavioral assessment? And was there a BIP, a behavioral intervention plan? And we're seeing a lot of cases now in the past few years where a federal judge held that the school district failed to do a proper FBA. It was missing some of the critical elements. So because that assessment was flawed, the behavioral intervention plan was automatically flawed. Thus, the kid has been denied faith. And the denial of faith started back when they did the FBA. So the kid is entitled to compensatory education going back to XYZ point in time, maybe several years prior. And then when you get comp ed, the law of comp ed is not that you, if they, let's say, uh, making it a simple case, let's say they uh, failed to provide 60 hours of speech therapy to a kid because the teacher was out of maternity leave and it couldn't get anybody. Uh, and by the time it got resolved, that, that 60 hours of speech therapy, that was, that was two years ago. So is a kid now entitled to 60 hours? No. Oh, far behind is a kid now because of that 60 hour loss two years ago. So the kid might be, uh, uh, they, they, they make a, might, might find kids entitled to 90 hours, 120 hours, you know, 240 hours. What, what is it going to take to recoup that uh, loss? Okay, moving on. N next statute then. So that's a real, real fast overview of, of IDEA. There are five key statutes. And when you're wrestling with an IDEA question, you look at the statute first, then you look at the federal regs. Then you look at your state regs and state statute. Now, with regard to words that are in the statute that are not clear or a concept the way it's written in the statute is not clear. If it's not clear, when the Department of Ed put it in the federal regulations, they will not rewrite what Congress wrote. And when the proposed rates come out, the public writes in and makes suggestions and they hold hearings around the country. And there are times when uh, they will they will say, and what is it? There's a um, one of the uh, statutes about when a kid moves, the kid's entitled to a comparable IEP. And mm -hmm. so people uh, said they wanted the Department of Ed to define the word comparable. Well, Congress didn't define it, so the Department of Ed is not going to usurp Congress's authority. They didn't have to touch that. So. When they wrote the regs, they kept the word comparable as it was with no further definition. But in the commentary, when they issued the regs, this document called the commentary, they explained that we were we received a lot of requests to define comparable, but it's not necessary to define comparable because it obviously means similar or equivalent. Hmm. In other words, they defined it by saying we're not going to define it. Sounds almost like a lawyer or a politician. <laughs> and that's exactly, and that happens many times in the commentary. So many times when you see something that's not clear, they're not going to clarify it overtly. They're going to say it's not necessary to clarify it because this statute means this and this, also because of those statutes. So they do clarify by telling you they're not. So be, a, okay. be aware of the power of the commentary. So moving back on, moving over now. The 504, it's a civil rights law. Its purpose is not to prepare for further education, employment, and independent living. Not at all. It's uh, to, to basically uh, ha have the barriers uh, removed, equal access to education, and protect against discrimination. The purpose is to primarily provide uh, uh, to protect individuals from dis discrimination and access. So you think about 504 uh, and, and barriers, curb cuts, and of course, ADA curb cuts. ADA and 504 go hand in hand, uh, but they're not necessarily, they're not totally identical. Mm -hmm. But the person that wants to get a good handle on 504, I do recommend we have on our website, what, what I call it, what, we have a quiz on our website, what is your 504 IQ? And I recommend anyone who wants to get a handle on 504, 
take that quiz because when you take that quiz and I give you what, what the correct answer is, but then you'll see the authority behind it. And um, there, uh, there are actual case scenarios, the quiz is based on, uh, based on that. So at any rate, moving on, uh, 504 uh, and ADA both uh, have very, very broad eligibility, ADHD, allergies, asthma, diabetes, epilepsy, episodic conditions. So episodic conditions. Um, is, is one of the, the critical things. And I tell parents all the time, when you are reading a case and your child will say has diabetes, and this case is about a kid with asthma, um, and you say, well, that doesn't apply, and you move on, and you don't read it any further. So don't do that. Whenever you're reading any case at all, substitute your child's disability with the one in the case because the principles are so often identical and same and same and the resolution is. So it's just like reading an autism case versus dyslexia case. Uh, mm -hmm. Same, same. Autism, what do parents want to get? They want to get ABA, intense ABA. And in the old days, it was a big battle. ABA was thrown out the window. Uh, it, it, schools hated doing that because it was subversive conditioning and instead they, they, they had uh, a, a, a total, totally a di different approach, and and I would be telling parents um, that uh, I would refer, when I was having consultations, that I remember one time I referred uh, some California parents to an attorney, and this was a dyslexia case, and they wanted the Norton Billingham program at the so and so school uh, in their jurisdiction, private school, and they contacted an attorney, and the attorney said, I don't do those, I only handle uh, autism ABA cases, and parents got back with me, I told them. Uh, <clears throat> Call her back and tell her Pete Wright said to call back because it's the same case. It's just we changed the label, but the issue is the same. The label dyslexia versus autism, or in Gillingham versus ABA, and approach process, same thing. Okay, moving on. So, uh, what, what's better, an IEP or a 504 plan? Many factors impact the determination, determination of what's best. Now, you know, by law, our children are not entitled to what's best at all. But I tell parents, never use that word. It's a four-letter word when we're dealing with special aid. It's a four-letter word. Stay away from it. But in, in many instances, an IEP is better for a kid, uh, a kid with dyslexia specifically. In other occasions, though, 504 uh, is, is, a, is a, a, another way to go. Because what I found so often is if a kid has dyslexia and has an IEP, the focus um, may well be just on lowering the bar. We don't want to push this kid and make this kid feel anxious. And we're gonna provide the child with a lot of talking books and textbooks. And we're gonna provide the child with a full time A, 24 seven every day in school to read the stuff off the board and to, to write all the assignments out for the child. In other words, they're going to really handicap the person even more so by giving a full-time aid and not teaching the child how to read or write or do arithmetic. And that's the real problem with that. Whereas when it's a 504 plan, we're not going to lower the bar as much for this child. We'll provide some modifications and accommodations, some more accommodations, but not really lower the bar. So it's a balancing with how it's being approached in, in that school district and, and often with a particular child. And, and where a child has dyslexia and has a high similarity subtest score, that's one of the IQ subtest scores related to intellectual horsepower. When a kid has high similarities, so many times I find the bar gets lowered uh, uh, for the youngster and the expectations get lowered when that's the one youngster you don't want to do that for at all. So it, there's not a right or wrong answer. It has to do more with, with the facts uh, in that uh, area and what other, so many times it may be private tutoring, private or doing and tutoring, uh, and at the same time, regular public school classes. Otherwise, it's, it, there's no easy, there are no easy answers at all. Okay, so for background ADA, the Rehabilitation Act was passed long before ADA. That was in 1973 when the Rehab Act was passed, and 504 has been amended several times and later became the basis for the 1990 ADA. And then there were some cases in Congress and they really restricted ADA to, to only this, only that. 
and Congress didn't like what, what um, the Supreme Court had done. And so Congress revised ADA in 2008. So um, the, the law that we're dealing with in terms of IDEA, the Special Ed Law, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that was passed in 2004. And the amount of litigation related to 504 or ADA wasn't that much in the earlier years. And then when the law was changed in 2008, it has been creeping upwards steadily. And it has had a, a, a significant impact now. Uh, and, and I'm seeing fast changes because people are learning about some of the cases that have come out under ADA. So ADA has a bunch of different titles, you know, employment, uh, telecommunications. What we are interested in, um, Title II is about public schools. Title III is about, what it, it uses the, the phrase public accommodations and private schools, private services, daycare, nursery schools. So mm -hmm. Title II and Title III are, are different in terms of uh, who's covered, but the requirements that are essentially the same. It's not that it's a lower standard here or a lower standard there, but just a different uh, procedural route uh, and some slightly different requirements, but it, the essence of it for all practical purposes is the same. So look, look, look at it a little more. So, and be, keep in mind that ADA and 504 go hand in glove in most instances, not always, it's not 100%, but almost always. Some courts have said they are carbon copies of each other um, in terms of the impact and the effect, and others have said there are differences, and it's not, it's not a clear uh, rule on that, and you don't have to worry about that. So when you're thinking about an ADA issue, Title II is public school, Title III is private school, the regulations of the meat of ADA is much more so in, which is like IDEA, a lot of the meat of IDEA is in the regs, not in the statute. Remember, a reg cannot take away a right, but a regulation can provide more detail and more specificity. So the regs for ADA, Title II, uh, Part 35, 30, 35 dot whatever, has to do with public schools. 36 dot whatever has to do with private schools, private entities. And how you file a lawsuit is different. Title II has to do with entities that, that uh, have, have public funds, federal, federal funds, where Title III does not cover that. So Title II remedy is through 504, when you look at the enforcement part of a statute in ADA, whereas Title III is through civil rights statutes. But you're, you, you, uh, all the, uh, uh, the relief is the same. You can get injunctive relief, attorney's fees. They all follow the same route. And in many instances, the regulations for Title II and for Title III are identical. They're, duplicates of each other. In the statute, the ADA statute, it explains the definition of disability shall be construed in favor of broad coverage of individuals. And it has much more, and it, and it repeats that. It says the concept episodic conditions. And, and there's another statute here. It explains that it has to do with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities and a record of it, or even being required of it. And again, uh, and uh, it's episodic, but physical or mental impairments, that part of the language can be critical here because another statute in uh, ADA and, in, and in actually in the regulations, uh, the, and so 35, remember, was Title II public schools, 36 mm -hmm. private, the definitions of disability and the impair, mental impairment in both of them are identical. They both stay that the definition of disability includes dyslexia and other specific learning disabilities. The dyslexia is expressly written out and identified in ADA, whether you're dealing with a private school or you're dealing with a public school. And I don't, I, I, many people are not aware of that. Uh, and, and, and that's a, um, a powerful tool uh, to be able to use. When there are the different lines, yeah, move stuff around here. Um, when you are having issues, there are uh, um, a couple of pages on our website about filing of complaints. Uh, either the Office of Civil Rights, or if you're filing a complaint about a public school or Department of Justice, 
So I think we're going to talk about the agenda we're talking about, uh, my background, and then three key statutes. And now it's kind of the fun stuff here. Um, I, I, these cases are not unique cases. There's nothing precedential about them. Uh, the Cobb County case is one that just uh, um, came out very recently. And um, I'm doing a program in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm doing a live program, um, six hour live program. It's also going to be Zoom telecast. So we're going to have uh, um, both of them. And I was doing some work preparing for that um, a couple of weeks ago and stumbled on the Cobb County case, which is right then there, right, right next to, to Atlanta. And, uh, and so I went through and I read the decision and I was, in, it was really kind of fascinated by it. So then I went, I used what's called PACER. And I looked up uh, online, found the, federal, the complaint that was filed in federal court, and I was wow, that's impressive. That was one of the best, one of the well-drafted complaints that I read in a long time, where it is very, very clear, easy to understand. Uh, a stranger who knows nothing about law can read that complaint and, and have a good handle of what it's all about, and not be confused by it. So I, I had this one um, uh, that, that I selected, and then. Um, there were two of them that were 504 ADA uh, cases that, that uh, I liked. And, well, I'm working on a third edition of our law book, and, and I'm also incorporating a, a lot of this into that and, and these two cases. So let me go ahead now and uh, I'll do that. But I think so. I, I've got the case that here's one. But first, why don't we take a break? And what, you may have some questions you're getting. Um, and uh, but why don't we take a second and, and um, uh, do you have any questions there that you would like to ask me at this point? We've had a few come in. Um, one okay. parent has asked, so starting a 504 in elementary and later moving to an IEP is essentially in, an indication that the child's needs have not been successfully found and or remediated? I wouldn't make that conclusion. It may well be the correct conclusion, but I wouldn't make that until uh, I had good quality psychoeducational testing as to where, where was the kid's scores, reading, writing, arithmetic, and spelling before getting services, and mm -hmm. where are the scores now? And that's what I look at. And one of, the, one of the things that I really focus on are standard scores, percentile rank. Has that percentile rank gone down, the kid regressing? Has it flatlined, not gone up, not gone down, but no real change? Or has Diana came one with me, are the scores going up? And that's the, the issue. So the mere shift of a 504 to IEP or shift of an IEP to a 504 doesn't answer that question at all. That's just simply um, a, a shift in terms of how, what services are or not being provided. Okay. Another parent has asked about COVID compensatory funds. Who is entitled? If the children are kindergartners, will they most likely not be entitled? Additional services because they've been all virtual this year due to medical concerns. Becky DeVos, the head of, of U.S. Department of Education, one of the positive things she did was, or, her, or, or some people say it wasn't her, her, her administration did, was they made it clear that school districts were not out from under IDEA. Uh, that they did have to provide services and that we knew kids would be losing educational uh, services. They would be, uh, some of them would be regressing, that uh, lack of education was going to be harmful, and the children are entitled to compensatory education. They are entitled to compensatory education without regard to fault, without, without regard to whether or not the school district committed fault by failing to do this and failing to do that. And on our website, if you go to our website, in the upper left-hand corner, right around the banner line, in red is the word COVID. We have a whole page of stuff about, about COVID and, and all the resources. And I did a, um, a, a, I've done several training programs on COVID and comp compensatory ed. And I have a web page that has all of the case law of comp ed up through what's called the Draper case out of Georgia. That was the, uh, that, that case has been cited by all the other courts in, in talking about comp ed. There are two big cases in the field of comp ed, Draper, and before that was a Reed case. Reed said, you don't give an hour for an hour. You figure how much the kid lost, and that's how much more you got to give. Um, and, and Draper said, and you may have to provide it for three, four, five years beyond the kid's 
22nd birthday and ordered prospective private school tuition in, in a jury. For. So those, those are, are, are two bases then, and they are, and others were discussed. So um, here the uh, issue is, is not that whether the kid was in kindergarten or the kid was in the eighth grade. The issue is uh, how, how much of, of, of a loss, what is it going to take to compensate and to make up for? And to do that, to have that information, you've got to have data. You've got to have facts to prove your, 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 the, prove the amount of, of damage, the amount of regression. And that comes from both evaluations and many parents, we are recommending parents, uh, if find old video, if you have video of how the kid was doing and get current video of how the kid was doing. And if you have video of the kid reading or writing, spelling, you understand. If you don't have it, start getting it and, 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 and keep a, a video or record because the video stuff is very, very persuasive and very powerful in terms of of telling a story. Get another one for me and then I'll shift over. Well, and of course, there's a lot of questions about Texas. Um, you know, they were censored by the DOE and- Oh boy, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in 2018 it, and yeah. are staying in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I have, we, we have, uh, every year we have another, we come out with a book called our Year in Review book. Um, been doing it since 2015 and it is, at all of the U.S. Court of Appeals cases that have come out in that calendar year, and um, the, uh, the the Texas and, and the Feds, I, I followed that closely. And I and during that time frame, both when they were coming out with the Dyslexia Initiative, and also when when Texas was being slammed, uh, I had I did several programs. I did probably three programs uh, uh, a year in, in different parts of Texas during that time frame. So I had probably half a dozen programs or, or more. And so I, I attended one of those uh, and met you then. Did you? Oh, great. <laughs> okay, good. Glad, glad to hear that. Um, and um, so, so all, all this stuff about Texas getting, uh, uh, having the funds taken away by the feds, that's, that's up in, uh, I had the case in, because there was actual litigation in, uh, there, of course, and, and that's in our year in review book. And then the, the dyslexia initiative, uh, I was following that you know, before they came out with the, the this whole handbook and new approach, and then shifting away from IDEA to 504. And I did a whole thing about the the the, uh, the, the problems with it and, and how it was um, what I perceived to be illegal. And uh, I don't know if the case law is yet following that. I think we're just going to take some, some some case law to to get that cleaned up. Also, but 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 this ADA definition of dyslexia being in the ADA might be something that can be helpful. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, rather than necessarily pursuing it strictly as an IDEA issue, there, you know, there are other ways to skin that cat. Um, well, let me shift over now. Uh, Cobb County. This case is shift over, and I need to see if your um, screen will shift with me. It might not. Do you see um, uh, something about a New Jersey case up on screen? No, I what see you? your slide. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop sharing, and then I'll start back up again. So okay. bear with me. So now I'll, I'll share screen again. And oh, I didn't want that one. Do you see a federal court complaint up on screen? Yes, for Cobb County. Good, okay. Um, this, I, I like this a lot because this was so well drafted. And I, I, I encourage everyone that's, that's watching this to, to read this complaint because it, you can read statutes, you can read regulations, you can think you understand them, but here is how the lawyers literally put it all together. So they made it clear, this case is being brought under IDEA uh, 20 USC 1400. This is the code of federal regulations and also under section 504. And here are the regulations under 504 and also under the Georgia regs. And mm -hmm. then they give you a little background about the kid, CP and so on. And the school district wanted to move the kid to a more intensive placement. Um, change of placement rather than intensify the services in the existing placement and the parents objected and they filed the due process uh, request uh, and the school system 
when the parents filed a request, filed a motion for a summary determination, and the uh, judge, the, the hearing officer, granted the school district's motion with that hearing evidence. They filed it on affidavits. And so they, they talk about the statute here. This is coming coming under this statute. That's Remember I said 1415 is the one that takes you in, 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 into court and all the legal procedures. And they also brought under Title II. This is the Title II part of ADA. And they also brought under 504. And so here are the actual cite, citations for the statutes. So as you as you read something like this, and if, uh, and if you have access to the statute, our, our new book, our, our third edition, is going to have all of the uh, ADA and 504 statutes and regs in it, oh, wow. um, in addition to the IDA. But when the first edition came out, ADA had not been revised. It was, uh, and 504 wasn't getting that much airtime. So at any, at any rate, they, they, they really spell it out well. And then it goes through, you know, uh, what, who is this person, what do they do, and if they had exhausted their remedies and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a good decision to, to, uh, to read, to get a feeling for it. They went through the law here and told you it's like a little uh they could have made a, a monograph out of this part right here starting at paragraph 11 you know uh, telling a story what it, what is idea idea all about and when they revised it and its purpose um and, and so it, it it's just it's superb you just don't see it written as well as it. that also gives you the legal citations so you don't have to say well i don't know if that's right or not i don't believe that is then giving you the legal authority for uh, every everything they have in here and and uh, the remedies, et cetera. Okay, so now let me let me shift over then to, to my uh, take care case. This is a case. Child uh, uh, had toileting issues in a daycare center. Um, so it was a private. Uh, daycare facility that has a, a, I think a national um, impact. They, they're, uh, I have a bunch of them around, uh, around the country. Uh, they, I guess they're headquartered in Pennsylvania and they have eight uh, network private schools, 18 states uh, and so on. And uh, it's a public accommodation, not a public school, public accommodation under Title III, which is the same thing. Uh, uh, as, as for our purposes, a private school. And I tell you about uh, what happened and that the school disenrolled her because she uh, basically had met their criteria for becoming toilet trained by a certain time. That was the issue, Didn't, was, wasn't toilet trained. Uh, and so uh, they ended up getting slammed, the, the uh, um, daycare facility did. And, and this case here was brought by US Department of Justice. Okay, well, yeah, so it's so pretty neat. You see, uh, so it's, it, this is a good one to know about, uh, and uh, and it's just a, a private daycare facility that's got a national focus. Now, let me find uh, one of the other cases here that I like. And this one here, can now do you see Ramsey versus the National Board? Yes, perfect. Right, and I notice it's S A Y. Um, Ramsey, uh, a medical student and has dyslexia and ADD, ADHD. And all through undergraduate and even uh, uh, through, through higher ed, and at several levels when she was in medical school, she was provided with accommodations. Mm -hmm. Difficult accommodations that are provided to individuals with ADD, ADHD, and dyslexia. But then when it came time to being tested to, uh, this test is critical with your, your uh, placement, um, in terms of, of your, you get your, your, where you're getting your practice, they wouldn't do it. Mm. And so she spells out here, uh, they spell it uh, uh, again, the facts of the case uh, and so on. And the court turned around and, and ruled uh, against the um, uh, National Board of Medical Examiners. And the decision is also uh, up on our website. So uh, let me turn off sharing. And I just, I wanted to show, um, uh, parents that if, if you read some of these cases, and these two cases are not major or shattering landmark cases, not like Andrew F. These are just regular one of the no cases. But if you can see how they allege this and allege that and what they hung their hat on, uh, it, I, I think it, it, it's uh, it's helpful and it makes more sense. And uh, so I guess 
let me go back to my power. I'm going to open up the PowerPoint slide, but then the last slide that I had said that with the changes to ADA in 2008, many more legal tools to the dyslexia community have, have become available. And uh, I, I have this slide says reading both complaints filed in court and the decisions can help you understand uh, and develop creative ways to tell a story that passes muster that causes the person with power wanting to rule in your favor. You know, that, that's why I, I, I want parents to have a feeling for not just what the statutes and the regs say, but read the stories, read the real pages and, and see if you gotta get a sense um, as, as to how to spin it. Yeah. <laughs> you said, so when I saw you lecture in person and I saw you at the University of Houston, um, you had, you had called out when special education had shifted. So, you know, for some of us above a certain age, you know, special education was more of an isolated thing, right? The students were off on their own. They weren't integrated into the general population. It was, it was a whole thing over there, right? But how IDEA really changed all of that and made it a service and not a place. Mm -hmm. When was that, and you called it out specifically in that lecture, and there's been so many times since then that I wish I had noted that down, but I didn't get that in all of the notes I was taking as fast as I You, you attended the program, that means you have the red law book. Yes. <laughs> Go back and read the history part. It's okay. either chapter one or chapter two, I don't recall which now, um, and read about the Park, this is what you're thinking of. It's a Park case and the Mills case. Okay. Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Children. If you're if you your IQ is below a certain level, by law, a school psychologist just could say you're uneducable and no responsibility to provide an education. That was the mm -hmm. Park case. In the Mills case, if a child was taken away from the parents because the parents abused and neglected or abandoned the child, the child went into the DC Junior Village. So these children's home and DC public schools told uh, that other sister agency, all those kids with disabilities, our, our doors are closed and many other children. And that if you have disabilities, you can't attend our school because we can't afford to educate you. And that was the defense they used. We can't afford to educate you. Uh, and those were, that was the, the, so all the articles in the Washington Post, these 72 and 73 of these two cases, they actually started in 71. A lot of articles in the Washington Post, which caused Congress to hold hearings. So they began holding hearings because the, the reporters went out on the street, were interviewing kids on the street, were not in school. And the, and the kid would say, well, yeah, I can't read. They, they say, I can't learn how to read because I have dyslexia. And that means I, by definition, I can't read and you can't learn how to read. So they won't let me go to school. And that was the mindset. I mean, I, I even heard that today. So I'm not, I have heard that more recently also. Well, you know, dyslexia means a kid can't learn how to read. Oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, so that, that was this. That was the swing, big swing point. Then, then we've had some some, some other swings in the, since the law has passed. When you know autism, we had we had two medical cases where the mm -hmm. Supreme Court said a kid is eligible, uh, and up to that point, the kid with autism were not eligible because it was a medical condition, uh, and, and now autism act, is actually in the statute, in the words, uh, mm -hmm. in the regs too. But so we've had sh shifts and changes, and Draper was one big shift. That I mentioned before, uh, the Reed case and the Draper case in Comp Ed, and, and then you know, my Carter case that really opened the door for kids getting reimbursement for private school placements and opened the door for um, ABA autism. That allowed parents of kids to get reimbursed for ABA services, even though the ABA providers were not specialized certified. Because that was the issue, the, one of their issues in the Carter case. It was no one in Dillingham um, School. <laughs> Whoa, wow, what a horrible thing. Don't be doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura asked the question Have you seen IEPs taken away due to progress? Um, I have had cases where kids, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not that the IEP is taken away, it's that if the kid loses eligibility. Right? Mm. That's the only way they can do that. And you cannot lose eligibility unless the school has. Doing a reevaluation of the child. So, first, it has to be a reevaluation. Uh, the only other way a kid, a kid loses eligibility is graduates from school with a regular high school diploma or reaches, in most states, 22nd birthday. 
In other words, you can't terminate services unless those two conditions. You have to have a, 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 an evaluation. If the evaluation shows the child is no longer eligible, mm -hmm. then I have had those cases, but those were cases that the parents were pleased because uh, the, the two cases that come to mind right away where the child had severe autism, was uh, oblivious to the family pet, to the siblings, and was in a whole nother world doing you know, a lot of the self stimulatory behaviors, uh, just uh, almost like a, a mental vegetable of sorts. And mm -hmm. then got good, good quality ABA, was began interacting, and got to the point where kid was doing great and continued for a couple of years and no longer needed special ed. And 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 I had that happen two cases uh, where, where where the kids parents were originally told oh, your kids gonna have to be institutionalized. Of course, never happened. One of them is a rocket scientist now. Works <laughs> for NASA. Yeah. Um, Pre-psychological educational evaluation and post-PEE should happen with how much time in between? I don't know that I understand the question. Can you clarify if you have a sense? Um, so the question came from Misty. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. She, that's her only comment. You want to repeat it again? Pre-psychological educational evaluation and post-PEE, I'm guessing is psychological educational evaluation, should happen with how much time in between? So how much time in between psychological evaluations? Um, it, it, it depends upon the, on the nature of the test. There are some tests that should not be re-administered within a year because of what's known as a practice effect on some of the questions and scores. And so they can be artificially inflated. But there are some other ones that you could administer. Woodcock Johnson psychoeducational battery has a form A and a form B. Mm. So you can administer form A, do a bunch of intense interventions, and three months later, give form B. And you're not going to get a practice effect. But you are going to get whether or not there's been growth. We need to because they're all normally the same way. Some others, uh, some aspects of IQ testing um, are related to a practice effect, and other aspects have know him or, or not impacted at all by practice effect. So it really goes to your evaluator knowing the instruments that are being used and 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 and, and, and explaining I would I many times wanted the same test administered twice so I could see progress over time or lack of progress. I wanted evidence of that. And um, so it's a question of uh, having an evaluator knows what what is okay to use and what it, what, what is not. Or if it is uh, impacted by that, to explain that in the body report and, and assess how much practice effectively may have occurred or may not have occurred. Um, this is a question from Gina. It's specific to Michigan, but we have the same thing going on in Texas and I'm sure in other states as well. Michigan is for bipartisan bills trying to get dyslexia legislation passed. Any advice or support to get these bills signed? <laughs> I'm the grandparent, I'm the legislator who's a grandparent of a kid with dyslexia. That's the one that does it. Um, in, in, in Congress, way back 10, 15 years ago, there were some real battles with regard to autism. And, and, um, and there was a very, very conservative congressman who was not considered to be a friend of education at all. But um, uh, he became a friend of the autism community because of his own grandchild. And in Virginia, uh, we had a, a, a legislator who was a very powerful legislator uh, who was head of the, uh, the, I think the finance committee and something else. And he was considered to be very conservative. But his grand, his, his daughter kept coming, and he was a lawyer. His daughter kept coming to him because of the problems that they were having with the school district and, their, and, 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 and her child his grandchild, and he came to me uh, and ended up putting several bills uh, through the Virginia General Assembly uh, and, and was opposed by it. And there were many special educated kids there testifying against his proposed bills. So you get, you, you find someone who's got a grandkid with these issues and, mm -hmm. and get that, uh, and you, you gotta have a good, you gotta find a good member base. You, you wanna the, the tap into the, you know, the, the all you know, the Orton Society, Learn Disability Association, 
um, decoding dyslexia, and they're out there now, much more so than they used to be, much more so than they were 10, 15 years ago, much, much broader. Parents are much more active. And, and I would do some hunting and, and try to find out and, and get uh, one of those parents to come forward and, and, and tell you their story and then get them to join, become a part of the committee to help revise the statute or the reg or whatever else. <laughs> and you best believe they'll talk to their parents or their, you know, whatever, or their mother-in-law or father-in-law, whoever it might be. <laughs> nice. Um, have you ever helped a child with low vision to prove their case? School rejected findings based on a child's existing disabilities of low vision. So the child has low vision and dyslexia. How do they define low vision? What, what is that? What, 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 what's your what they mean by that? The child is technically legally blind. Okay. So but I don't understand the issue then because the kid, you, you can have dyslexia and also have autism. You can have dyslexia and cerebral palsy. You can have dyslexia and any other number of conditions. They're not mutually exclusive. In, in some states, they have a primary disability and a secondary disability, and the primary determines services. And that's bizarre because the statute doesn't say anything about that. The statute says the purpose of the evaluations in 1414 are to determine the child's education needs in order to develop the IEP, not to narrow down the focus. We have the kid doesn't have this disability, the kid can't get speech language or whatever else it might be, or the kid can only get speech language if the kid has this label, but we don't want the kid to have this label because then this will happen ahead. And that's bizarre. So the shift, the focus has to be on what, what are the child's educational needs? All right, just likes you. So what do you do for that? Low vision, what do you do for that? And um, I, I, it's beyond my expertise, depending upon the severity of the low vision, you're gonna be getting into using a form of braille or something also, or not? I, I don't know. But um, uh, there, there will be, I would have to assume that there'll be an expert out there who has worked with kids with dyslexia and low vision. And, and you gotta find who that person is. I, I had a case one time where a kid, uh, school system said the kid was mentally, severely mentally retarded. M Mom said it was not. Kid went into a mentally retarded class. Mentally retarded, the teacher, of, and that was in the days when he was mentally retarded, the teacher of, of the kids in that class told the mother, he's not mentally retarded, but couldn't get uh, eligibility to change and not getting services. The parent came to see me and uh, I had him tested by a, a private psychologist and uh, some of the scores came down low we said these subtest scores are repressed not because of intellectual ability, but because of auditory processing. If you can't hear half what I'm saying, right. get, a, get a comprehensive uh, auditory neuro linguistics evaluation. We discovered the kid's auditory memory was zilch. He couldn't remember two or three words at all. And, and so then they said, have them tested by a psychologist who specializes in working with children, with deaf children. We did, I think it was above average. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you have to find a really good expert in a particular area unique to that issue. Well, and that's good to know, because unfortunately I do hear, as an advocate, I hear way too many times about, you know, because the child presented initially with this condition, that dyslexia is being denied because, you know, this condition is just everything. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's all about educational needs, and that's right there in 1414, that's the, the, the evaluation statute. That has an IEP statute, and that's the target. We um, oh, and she she did add a comment. The child needs large print or digital media, but not braille. Well, so, yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, I think I've gotten to all of the questions. I may have accidentally skipped over some. If I have, everyone, I do apologize. <laughs> The way that Facebook controls my feed, it's hard for me to necessarily see everything. <laughs> Pete, thanks so much. You're juggling Zoom and Facebook, and you, I know. you have your cell phone and you have your <laughs> laptop in front of you, too. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Well, thank I can you. tell you don't have ADD, ADHD. You, don't, you can multitask all day long, right? <laughs> I try. Sometimes I multitask too much, and then I can't get anything done. <laughs> But thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to having you back and talking sure. about more things in the future. So I so appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you very much. I enjoy it. Thank you. Awesome. 
Thanks. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. Bye. And you have to end the Zoom because <laughs> you're the host. <laughs> oh, I'm the host now. Yep. Oh, oh wait, wait. I, I, I can. Uh, I will, okay, I'll, I'll just end it. Here we go. You ready? Yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs>